think we'll get going because we've got a fair bit to get through this morning. So um, I'll be talking about the Swix news and then Andrew Manhattie will be dealing with the um, events of October. And then our guest this week is Rory Bateman, who's uh, the manager of the list equity part of Australia British Opportunities. So without further ado, um, these are the four stories that I've picked out for this week. Uh, lots of interesting things going on. Um, Thomas Lloyd is a, is a new listing, uh, proposed anyway, um, that I think looks quite interesting. Um, Aberdeen China uh, is in the process of, of coming together. Uh, Gresham House Strategic, we've got the sort of final bit of news on that, perhaps. And then just one little snippet on U Green Coat UK Wind. So let's start with Thomas Lloyd. Um, the real difference with this one is that it's focused on Asia. Um, none of the other trusts have uh, any intention of doing this at the moment. I think maybe VH Global could do, but I don't think there's, there's actually any uh, immediate intention. It's looking for $340 million, which uh, is reasonable, I think, and, and achievable, especially as we'll find out in a minute, there's got a couple of big um, cornerstone investors. The yield's going to be quite attractive. I think it probably needs to be because there's a bit of added risk involved in investing in Asia. Uh, so 7% dividend yield once it's all fully invested and up and running, which is uh, 2024. And then a sort of smaller dividends for 2022 and 2023 before that. And then again, once it's fully invested, looking for returns, uh, any of the return returns for about 10 to 12%. There's no debt at the company level, but like all of these renewable funds, there uh, is the capacity to put debt in at the project level. So the, the company holds a series of projects in separate legal entities. Um, and they're talking about up to sort of 50 to 65 percent loan to value, which turns into gearing that looks quite high, but is not that unusual. Um, part of the reason they can get away with this is because, as we've seen a second, it's got quite predictable income flows. Um, the debt they're going to use, um, I didn't like the bit that said we might have US dollar debt because that's quite often a recipe for disaster in um, Asian markets. But actually, most of it, I think, is probably going to be in local currencies. And they say this is one way that they can effectively hedge part of the currency risk of the portfolio, um, which makes sense to me. Um, and they were actually hedged the money flowing off to pay the dividends. So they won't be sort of caught short on paying a dividend because of a currency move at the last minute. Um, now, cornerstone investors. So there's a stock swap of assets going into the fund, which would be $35 million worth of that 340. Um, but the big news is that the Farm and Commonwealth Development Office uh, is thinking about investing £25 million in this through a new scheme that got announced at COP26, where they're basically providing sort of seed investments to kickstart renewable energy projects and stuff in um, developing markets. So I think this is all quite exciting. It's still not absolutely concrete because they say they've got to do due, due, due diligence on it. And obviously, they've got a prospectus now, or, or they'll be seeing a draft it quite soon. And the seed assets, um, $59, $59 million worth, um, look quite cheap to me. I don't know if that's because it's um, because of the debt involved, and that might complicate things, but we can't see that at the moment. So um, maybe when the prospectus comes out, it'll be more obvious. Um, but projects in India and Philippines. And then the pipeline is those two countries plus Indonesia, Vietnam, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. So because we're talking sort of fairly racy emerging market stuff, fairly racy, I mean, not, not outrageous. Um, I think it's quite important that the, the off takes, so the people buying the power are actually going to be sort of government type institutions for the most part. And that gives you some... Um, well, some, some reason, reasonable hope that um, the income is going to flow as it should do. And they're going to be long term contracts as well, which is which is all good news. Obviously, there's a huge amount to do in, in adopting renewable energy in all of these markets. And so I think this sort of investment is going to be welcomed uh, in most of these places. Um, the manager's got a bit of experience in doing this. Uh, it's quite well, well resourced. Um, they, they're quite a 10 year track record, and then, then again, it gives three year numbers, which is slightly strange. But uh, again, that, that might all become a bit clearer in the prospectus. Um, but they are sort of within that target range. So I suppose that's good. 
And the fees don't look too bad. I mean, um, they could have been maybe a little bit lower, but but 1.3% to kick off is, is not outrageous. And there's no performance fee, which is obviously a good thing too. So all in all, I think maybe one to um, have a look at, um, but obviously wait and read the prospectus before you make any decision. Um, Aberdeen, China. So as we know, this is being formed from merger of Aberdeen New Thai and Aberdeen Emerging. Aberdeen Emerging has already changed its name um, and is now trading under the new ticker. Um, Aberdeen New Thai is sort of chuntering along. There, there's um, another vote. So they've had one vote to approve the scheme and there's another vote to put that um, company into liquidation so they can roll the assets into the Aberdeen China Fund. That will happen next week. Uh, and we'll also find out next week how many of the Aberdeen New Thai shareholders have ticked the cash exit box. Um, that is only limited to 15% of the trust, um, which may be on the small side. And I'll tell you for why it might be true. So <clears throat> let's first look at Aberdeen China. This is their um, share price in NAV chart for um, this year. And as you can see, the discounts widened out a bit um, over the last couple of weeks. Um, really, since this announcement was made and, and things have been settling down, and I think part of that is because there seems to be a lot of frustrated sellers again. This is a very similar situation to what we had with Fidelity Emerging, but 94.3% of all the shares were tendered, which is a huge amount when you think about it. Um, basically, you, that's 94.3% that's of the fund saying we would get out if you, we was trading on a 2% discount. Um, obviously, the tender was limited again to 15% of this one, um, so there, there's a big overhang in theory. Now, one thing to bear in mind on this is that all these shareholders did vote for this scheme. So had they been really upset and really wanted the cash back, they could have refused to back it um, and, and demanded 100% cash exit at the time. They didn't do that. And I, I'm wondering now whether this one, and maybe Fidelity Emerging too, it's just these people being slightly canny in that they see that there's an opportunity here to realize some of their shares. They want to make sure that they get out as many as they possibly can, but they are conscious of the fact they're gonna be holding an ongoing fund. So maybe that they're, they're not looking to, to get out of all of it, but we really can't read their minds, so we don't know. Nevertheless, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in the aftermarket for this. Because obviously, obviously, with the discount widening already, um, I think they'll be quite keen to, to ramp up the marketing on this and get some new investors in. Um, and I do think, actually, a lot of those investors would sell if it was trading close to asset value, simply because they, they, an awful lot of them are discount players. So anyway, we'll wait and see. Um, Gresham has strategic. So we've been back and forth on this. Um, over the past month or so, or a couple of months, guys, um, the board has sort of given up. Um, they've decided that realistically, there's no chance that the repositionists won't win the meeting that, um, as, as they've been proposed. Harwood is going to start running the fund from 5th of November, and that will happen, or which is today. Obviously, that will happen regardless. But they said they're going to work for free, and I find that slightly strange. We'll come back to that in a second. Um, the requisition has said we want our money back within two years and we want the cash that's in the portfolio now distributed straight away. Um, it seems likely that that's going to be proposed. So there will be a circular coming out. Um, and I think maybe that will have a few more resolutions in it that will basically pave the way for all of this to happen. Um, the director that they wanted to put onto the board, Simon Piper, um, he's going to come onto the board as soon as possible. The existing interim chairman, Helen Sinclair, has resigned already, and Charles Berry, another director, will resign as soon as Simon joins. Um, so that will shrink the board down. The only sort of wrinkle in all of this is that the, um, the message very much from Gresham House, which was the dissenting shareholder, was that they didn't think it was fair that, that people would be trapped in the fund um, going on. And they said there was a big chunk of people that wanted their money back. From that point of view, from being fair to all shareholders, 
there, there might also be a substantial chunk of investors that want to be want to carry on being invested. So I'm wondering if there's some scheme that might emerge where people have a rollover option into um, existing hardwood fund, perhaps. So we just have to wait and see whether that materialises. So it might not be the completely end of the story, but I think we're almost there now. Finally, quickly on Green Code UK Wind. Um, this week, it's raising more money um, to help fund uh, a new investment that it's just made in an offshore wind farm. Um, so as part of a consortium that led by various Green Code uh, investments, where they're buying 25% between them, the, the uh, stake that Princote's buying is 15.7% for a quarter of a billion pounds, so a big chunk of money. And the thing that caught my eye on this um, was that this wind farm has um, subsidies, well, a contract for difference. So basically, it's guaranteed selling price of electricity of 100, almost £177 a megawatt until 31st of March to, to 2032. Now, that uh, really is quite chunky. If you look at this on the, this chart here, so this is a chart of base load power prices in the UK, which, as we know, have went mental over the past year. Um, and that's really been driven by rising gas prices um, and also quite low wind speeds, actually, as it happens. So that, um, that's one reason why. Um, there's that pink line is that £176.57, um, which just shows you that the cost of this, this wind power is way above the normal price of base load power uh, for almost all of that period, apart from the brief spike. And uh, now prices are, are way back down here. So down sort of like 99 and a half-ish, I think it was when I did this chart. Um, which just shows you that, that, that this power is actually very expensive. It's also quite expensive when you look at it. So these are the four big wind farms that were approved in the auction round in 2019. And the prices that they are getting for their power are way, way, way lower. So close to much closer to 40 pounds a megawatt. Um, so actually it's gonna be interesting to see, obviously in 2032, the income from this investment is gonna dive off a cliff. Um, uh, but obviously that's been factored by Greenco into their purchase price. But it, but it is interesting, I think, because the power prices haven't been up here, when this new power starts to come in in 22, 20, uh, 20, 23, 24, 25, they are going to be dragged down a bit. And this is what has been dragging down power price estimates um, across the board, um, which has been uh, affecting any of these a bit. So um, something like this, which has got a uh, super normal uh, income, is actually quite an attractive buy uh, for a bit, but um, it will roll over and it will the drop will be dramatic. Anyway, that's enough from me. Uh, let's now hand over to... Andrew, hang on, I didn't put the slide in there to welcome Andrew, but um, nevertheless, we'll let him share his screen and... Uh... Yep, lovely, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, James, as normal. Let me just uh, pick the right screen to uh, share. And uh, we'll talk about the movers as usual. Uh, you've touched on a few things there, James, and I might, I might return to actually uh, tender offers and IPOs and the sort. Um, but anyway, here are the movers for October. And there were quite a lot of gains over 10%. It was a pretty good month overall. Uh, I would ignore the top one there, Gab Gabelli Merger Plus, which is a, a highly illiquid trust. Uh, but there were some pretty good movers. And um, those are the four that I'll talk about in more detail. Uh, I think I probably talked about at least three of those before. but. Um, but I quite like coming back to the same things and, and learning a bit more each time. So, uh, so I'll do that. Uh, just a quick look at the, um, the fallers. Again, the top one there, Asiana Properties, that's one of those uh, investment companies that uh, you, you may decide should be in the sector or not. It's a property developer, really. But uh, anyway, there we are. Again, quite illiquid. I think the fall in Acorn Income Fund is also a bit illusory as well, because that was just before the shares were suspended, and that doesn't reflect the amount you're going to get paid out uh, in the winding up. Uh, but not many falls, actually. It was overall a pretty strong month. 
Um, so let's have a look at a couple of these in a bit more detail. I mean, hydrogen one capital growth has been a, an interesting uh, trust since its um, IPO at the very end of July, because it had a great start, got up to about one uh, sixteen, uh, and then it fell all the way back again, back to a pound, uh, and and then uh, got got its second wind, <laughs> and uh, and has gone back over one twenty. Again, in fact, it has fallen back slightly uh, yesterday and this morning. Um, the point here is that um, there have been some quite good opportunities here if, you, if you're watching it and you're quite nimble, but also that um, this is at a large premium to the quoted NAV, where basically there haven't been any public events yet, and therefore the NAV is largely unchanged on the launch. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean a great deal. There's probably going to be a shift in the NAV when uh, when it's next uh, announced uh, after some events. Um, but uh, I think the point is that it's, it's been a very good start for this IPO. And there have been quite a few lately that have started very, very well. Uh, and I've just um, mentioned here Literacy Capital, obviously Richard Pindar was on the, on the show last week. Uh, Seraphim Space and Taylor Maritime, uh, which was a brilliantly timed one uh, with the massive rise in shipping uh, freight uh, rates. Um, so I I'm warming to the idea of investing in IPOs, actually, particularly as um, many of them are obviously being launched in the alternative asset spaces where the existing trusts are standing at a premium. So, you know, in the infrastructure space, for example, the average premium on the trust there is 12%. And uh, every single trust in the sector is on a premium. So where you see new launches, you imagine they, they might well follow that trend. So I think there's been a shift here from maybe a year or two ago when a lot of new issues would um, just... Uh, uh, trade pretty quietly after launch at around 102 and they wouldn't do very much for six months while they got their money invested uh, and I think maybe that's shifted now there's more of a focus on getting the money to work quickly and um, certainly no, the market is not shy about generating quite large premiums to, <laughs> to NAV straight away so that's interesting um, and I think IPOs are uh, uh, maybe a bit more attractive now than they have been in the past um, Dunedin Enterprise had another good month because it announced uh, both a dividend and another tender offer for shareholders. This is part of its long winding up process, which has been going on for um, five and a half years now. Um, and I know it's a bit wearisome, really, to have these long winding up uh, processes. And some people don't like them and think that um, they should probably sell out when it happens. Um, but I'd just like to explain, actually, why that might not be the best approach and just how good this one has been. Uh, I did mention a month or two ago that it, it had done well from it, but it was a slightly woolly statement on my part. So I, I've dug into it and um, examined it a bit more. If you look at the chart here, which is a five year chart, it doesn't really look as though Dunedin Enterprise has done very well. Uh, and the discount hasn't uh, uh, closed up too much. So you would think, well, it probably hasn't been all that great. But actually, uh, the, the history, which is quite complicated, um, tells a different story because there have been, there's been a lot of money coming back to you. It's been a mixture, and I'm not expecting you to read this and take it in. It's been a mixture of dividends, of capital distributions, and more recently, tender offers. Uh, so there has been quite a lot of money coming back to you. And uh, just to save you the trouble, I have done some calculations to figure out exactly <laughs> how much has come back. So let's say you held um, £10,000 in the trust after the original announcement um, that it was going to, to wind down. That was in February 2016. Um, actually, assuming you took up the tender offers, uh, the remaining number of shares you've got now is slightly lower, but the share price is up a bit. So your holding is actually worth almost exactly the same, uh, 10,000, just over 10,000 pounds. The interesting part, though, is that you've had total distributions of 13,000 back to you. 
So actually you've done very well. Your overall return is 132%, which is almost 16% compound annualized. So um, I think the, the, you, digging into the, the figures is, uh, is just fun for me to do, but um, the, the point to make here is that actually, if you do see trust winding down, and obviously Gresham House Strategic is uh, going to do that now, then um, uh, there can be a lot of value to be had if you're patient. Uh, and uh, that's certainly true with Dunedin Enterprise, which has exceeded expectations, I would say. Um, in the same sector, I'll just talk about Harbour, uh, Harbour Vest Global Private Equity, um, which is a, a diversified fund of funds. And I think for me, uh, I mean, this has always been a, a high quality trust seems to be well managed. And it seems to me to be quite a good example of the outstanding uh, market value that has been available to investors in the private equity sector for quite a long time. And when you're as, as long in the tooth as, as I am, uh, you, you, you've seen the valuations uh, shift quite a lot in the broader investment trust market. And uh, to me, a lot of the valuations seem quite rich nowadays compared to where they were in the past. But the one sector where you can still obtain a lot of value in terms of the discounts is private equity. And it's not necessarily that hard to, I mean, not, not that easy, sorry, to understand why that is. Uh, because it's been a good sector, this trust you can see, apart from the, the, the obvious dip here at the start of the pandemic, um, it's made pretty steady progress and its five-year returns are very good in the top decile of all investment companies. Uh, and if you look at the list there, the ranking list, it's rubbing shoulders with trusts that are on a, uh, a substantial premium, things like Linsell Train, 3i and Impacts Environmental. Uh, and yet the shares here, uh, where the discount has narrowed a bit in the last couple of weeks, is still 18.4%. Uh, so to my mind, there is still some value in the private equity sector, which is uh, absent uh, elsewhere in the investment companies universe. So I think that's interesting. Um, uh, this is a peculiar one, uh, and I'll finish on this. Uh, VPC specialty lending, I think is not for everybody. It's quite an esoteric uh, trust. And I think uh, you'd have to classify it as high risk. So uh, I'll just have to preface my comments with that. Um, it's, it, it's a lender, but it, uh, and it makes asset backed loans to the, what it calls the non-bank financial sector, uh, mainly in the US, uh, some quite, um, uh, quite specialist companies it's lending money to. It's done quite well with its loans. I haven't had many problems at all. But the interesting part here is that it also gets some, some kickers from certain deals in capital terms. And its, um, its manager has been a, a sponsor of some uh, SPAC issues and, and VPC has taken a slice of those. And I think uh, with, with the SPAC industry, um, I'm not sure it's great for investors. I'm not sure it's all that good for the companies uh, backing into these uh, shells, but it's really good for the sponsors. I mean, they're, they're the ones who make the money from it. And um, here's a great example. So VPC had a slice of a SPAC that um, was effectively activated uh, last month when a, um, a company called uh, Bact which is listed on the NASDAQ now, um, which is a, a, a cryptocurrency marketplace uh, reversed into this. Um, and a, a week or so later, it announced a, a big deal with MasterCard, which gave it a lot of extra credibility and the share price uh, tripled overnight. Uh, and this um, was great news for this investment trust, which has shares and also sponsor warrants uh, in, in, uh, in, in BACT now. Um, and VSL indicated in its monthly fact sheet as a postscript that after the period end, um, the, uh, the, the shift in, in, in the valuation of BACT, which was suitably discounted by 30%, indicated a 14.2% increase in NAV. 
Uh, and that is not reflected in the in the figure here. You can see there's no jump here, and there's, that's not been in the price here at all because this is based on the month end NAVs. Uh, so in fact, the discount here is far wider than it appears. Uh, it's it's listed as thirteen percent. Uh, it's actually quite a lot wider than that if you take that into account. Although of course it's um, uh, not necessarily a particularly stable base. Sorry, not a particularly stable base having your uh, a big chunk of your NAV in a cryptocurrency marketplace. Um, but you, you also have the yield of 8.2%, which is from the standard uh, lending practices uh, to give you some backing. So that looks quite interesting. And I think there's one more step, actually. So it makes it even, even, even more interesting, which is that uh, BACT itself has been a very lively performer on, on uh uh, on the US market, if you have a look at it. Um, and the, uh, the quoted um, uh, price has been jumping around all over the place. Um, but it has gone up actually a fair bit more since the trust calculated that 14.2% uh, uplift. Um, I've uh, been enjoying uh, dusting off an old uh, uh, Black Shoals warrant pricing model. Uh, I spent 30 years of my life uh, valuing warrants. And um, I reckon the current NAV could well be 131 uh, here based on the, the latest uh, price of BACT, which is implying a discount of 26% for the shares. Um, now, I think that comes with a fairly chunky risk warning, you know, because, um, because of the volatility here and the nature of the business. Um, and the fact that VSL is also locked in for a year, so uh, it can't realize this straight away. Um, so uh, there are reasons, I think, for the discount. But nevertheless, it just comes back to the point that I think both James and I have made quite a number of times now, which is that you need to uh, look intelligently at the quoted discounts, I think, that very often uh, discounts for not just alternative asset trusts, but uh, other trusts as well. Um, uh, they're not always accurate. I mean, they're, they're, they're a director's reflection. Sometimes they're out of date. Sometimes they're not taking into account recent activities. Uh, so I think if you are prepared to do some digging and, and really look into the assets and perhaps perform some calculations yourself, uh, you can find some additional value. Uh, good. So with that rather complex thought, I will uh, leave you and uh, hand you back to James to have a chat with Rory. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. That's uh, very interesting. Now, yeah. oh, I don't know, I've lost it. Where's the uh, screen? There we go. Right. Welcome back. So, um, yeah, all very interesting. And it just reinforces again 